Hey folks, welcome back to the sky tonight. And again, this is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. And for this week, we are covering October 5th through October 11th. And in this edition of the program, we're going to talk a little bit about all those lovely fall objects and celestial treats to look at in the east. And we'll take a look at the Draconids meteor shower that will be peaking this week as well. Now, as we set the sun in the west this week, which happens just after 7 o'clock at this time of the year, we have been noticing or talking about those leftover summertime objects. Many of them are in the southwest and straight up in the sky, so we still have some time to see those. But let's really focus in on some lovely fall objects that we can find looking towards the east as we slide to that area. And once we're there, we're gonna speed up time, go a little bit later. This is just after it gets dark out, but let's go to about 9.30, maybe even closer to 10 o'clock. By then, these stars for this season will be high enough and easy to see for most locations by then. In the fall, looking towards the east, uh, just after 10 o'clock, I really take notice of two prominent star patterns or shapes in the sky. And right now, before I talk about those two objects, you will notice the red planet Mars shining really bright in this area. Mars is rising higher and higher each evening, and it's getting very close to us. Closest approach will be next week, which in next week's episode, we'll talk more about that. And on this evening of October 5th, you'll also find the waning gibbous moon after 10 o'clock. If you're watching this after the 5th, after this Monday, then the moon won't be in this area at this time. But everything else will about be the same. So what I really notice in this area, especially in the northeast first, are a group of stars that look like a letter W. Or if you turn your head, we'll zoom into a little bit more, it looks like a letter M. To me, in my opinion, it looks like a W, kind of stretched out a little bit. And these stars here represent the very well-known and very old constellation called Cassiopeia, which we can click on that star to highlight the W shape. Cassiopeia is a queen sitting on her throne, which we'll turn her on here. And she was the queen of Ethiopia and very bright. Actually, what I love about Cassiopeia, the stars really stand out, but it's also a useful tool in finding the North Star at this time of the year. Because normally we like to use the Big Dipper the end of the bowl points you to the North Star. But at this time, the Big Dipper, at least here in southern areas of the United States, is really low and below the horizon in the evening, so we can't use it. Big Dipper is down here. The North Star is there. But what I like to do with Cassiopeia is the open side of the W faces the North Star. It's not a perfect alignment here. It won't perfectly point to it, but it kind of will generally get you in the right direction for finding our North Star right there. So open side of the W faces Polaris, which is not one of the brightest stars, but still nice to find if you wanna know where North is exactly. Now turning back towards the east again, and not far from Cassiopeia, just south of it, you may find yourself looking at four fairly bright stars that make up a large square. This is actually a pretty well-known asterism, and I can turn those on just to show you that. These asterisms, which again are shapes that are not as formal as the 88 constellations that organize our sky. Usually asterisms are a little easier to see, a little more regional. So the square is pretty well known in this part of the world, and that square that you see there forms the body of a favorite among the characters from Greek and Roman mythology. Many of you have heard of Pegasus, the winged horse. These four stars represent the body of Pegasus, this flying horse in the night sky that we find very easily in the fall. Very large constellation. And again, look for that square shape of the body. The head sort of arcs out kind of more to the south here, and you might see some legs kind of shooting out in that direction there. So those two constellations at this time of year uh, are pretty high and they're fairly bright, so they stand out, Pegasus and Cassiopeia. 
There are a few other constellations for this time of year that are also are really nice and famous as well. Actually connected to Pegasus and sharing the same star uh, is the constellation Andromeda. See this left corner star of Pegasus? This is called Alpharats right here. And Alpharats is also part of the constellation called Andromeda. And Andromeda was a princess and connects to Cassiopeia. In Greek mythology, Cassiopeia was the queen of Ethiopia. She was married to King Cepheus, who is another constellation in the sky, a little harder to see. But Princess Andromeda is her daughter. And just to make a long story short, Princess Andromeda was chained to a rock, basically sacrificed on behalf of her parents. Because Queen Cassiopeia right here thought she was the most beautiful creature in the universe and let everyone know about it. That's why in the picture she's holding a mirror looking at her own face. She was very vain. And she thought she was even prettier and more beautiful than the sea nymphs of the ocean. And the gods, particularly Poseidon or Neptune to the Romans, caught wind of her proclamation of her beauty. And they did not like this. So they decided to send a giant sea monster named Cetus the Sea Monster after the, the kingdom of Cassiopeia and King Cepheus. And instead of taking the blame herself, Cassiopeia, she decided to sacrifice her daughter instead to the sea monster. And the sea monster is actually in the sky. It's actually kind of where Mars is. If you look in this area, kind of a relatively blank area looking in the east and southeast, not many bright stars. But the brightest star in this area, right here is a star called Difta. I always like that name. And Difta is kind of near the tail, at least in this way of thinking of it, of Cetus the sea monster, either the whale or just the sea monster. And a little bit harder constellation to find, but he's there. The sea monster was uh, tasked to basically take out the kingdom, but instead was going to eat and destroy Andromeda. Luckily, the story ends relatively nicely because someone saves the day. Actually, down here are the stars that look like a letter Y kind of backwards, like a lowercase letter Y in my opinion. These stars with the brightest star called uh, Merfac right here in the middle form Perseus, the warrior right here. Now, if I turn off the picture, you'll see the kind of Y shape I'm talking about here, kind of a sloppy lowercase letter Y but that's how I see it. And there is Perseus. He's the warrior who slayed the Gorgon Medusa. That's why he's holding the head of Medusa. And if you look in her eyes, you turn to stone. So he saw this sacrifice about to happen between the sea monster and Andromeda. He stepped in, he fought the sea monster, held Medusa's head up. So the sea monster looked in the eyes of, of Medusa's head and the sea monster turned to stone and he defeated this creature perseus did in those stories andromeda and perseus fell in love they married and lived happily ever after eventually andromeda became a queen so that's how these constellations are connected uh, in story and in the sky since they're all close to each other and you can see them quite easily in this area towards the east and again start with the square of pegasus and the W of Queen Cassiopeia uh, in the Northeast as well. And now that we've seen these fall constellations, next week we'll talk more about the interesting deep sky objects that you can find in this area. And there's some amazing things that are sort of hidden among these fall stars and constellations. The last celestial event I want to talk about is of a lesser known meteor shower that you can see every year early October in the north northwest and just to give us context here for what area we're looking at here if we're looking in the north this area this is the north star and the little dipper right here we can make sure to turn that on to show you the little dipper quite famous right asterism and also part of the bear called ursa minor the lesser bear and the Big Dipper is down here. You can see the handle, but below the horizon, as I mentioned earlier. But 
Meandering between the Big Little Dipper in the north are the stars of a really interesting constellation right here called Draco, which means the dragon. This is Draco the dragon. So this is the body right here. This is the head of the dragon. So let's click on one star there. Let's turn on Draco. We can even turn on the picture uh, as well to show you that along with Little Dipper and the little bear that it's part of. There is Draco. The head is not far from the bright star Vega, one of the brightest stars in our sky. Now back to the meteor shower I want to talk about. In this area, uh, at the beginning of October, specifically on the evening of October 7th is the peak of the Draconids meteor shower. And the radiant point is near the head of Draco the dragon. And what that means is, it doesn't mean all the meteors you'll see just in this area, but if you trace some of the meteors shooting in the sky uh, on this night, or even if nights before and after, a few nights before and after, the 7th, you can trace many of them back to this position, okay? Uh, that's the radiant point for the Draconids. And this is kind of a different meteor shower because it occurs best in the evening. Normally, it's best to view meteor showers in the early morning after midnight. They can be challenging for that reason. But this one's kind of nice. It's a little bit earlier. It's not one of the busiest meteor showers. Usually about five to 10 meteors can be seen per hour. But there have been some years that have seen some meteor outbursts or meteor storms that occur when a whole bunch of meteors um, will be emanating from this area, or at least near this area at this time of the year. This meteor shower comes from the comet called 21P Giacobini Zinner, and that's named after two uh, astronomers who helped to discover this comet uh, in the early 20th century. It's a, a comet that's uh, just a little over a mile in diameter, goes around the sun every about six in a half years and uh, so fairly well-known comet and every year it kind of for every orbit it, it leaves behind a debris field of little particles and in the beginning of October we go through that debris trail of comet Giacobini Zinner and that's what's happening here again not the most active meteor shower but one that can look interesting depending on the year. And the nice thing is the moon will have not risen by the time of the peak of the shower. So you don't have the obscuring effect of a bright moon uh, making the meteors harder to see because they're quite dim. So maybe get a chance just for a little bit on the evening of the 7th to take a look at a stray meteor or two or what we call shooting star, a piece of comet debris, a little rock or even piece of ice burning up in our atmosphere at tremendous speed and streaking through our sky. So that could be nice, the Draconids. This concludes another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you get a chance to view some of those lovely fall stars and constellations, along with a stray Draconid meteor or two. And come by our Loman Planetarium. We are open. We're doing shows safely every single day. So we'd love to see you there as well. Hope to see you again next week digitally with another edition of our Sky Tonight. Happy stargazing, and we'll see you soon.